you, but the sound was very, very weak for me. Sorry about that. We are also um, 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 seeking apologies from all of you. So that was a technical uh, issue. And um, so we sincerely apologize for what happened for the technical issues. And we make sure that we'll uh, not repeat this again in this today's session. I'm sorry <laughs> for that. So um, uh, I'd like to open the session for questions for Dr. Um, Jackis. Uh, if any of you have question, you can certainly email me. I would be pleased to answer your, your questions. Okay, does anybody have questions? Anyway, I'll share uh, Dr. Jackers' email ID as well in the chat box. If anyone has questions for Dr. Jackers, then you can directly write uh, an email to the, Dr. Jackers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay, uh, next, moving on to the next presentation. Uh, we have a, a presenter from uh, UK again. Uh, it's Dr. Richard Peter, Peter from CITOX Limited, Oxford, UK. And Dr. Uh, uh, Richard Peter is not available right now. And he can be able to join after the um, talk. He will be available for the question answer session. So meanwhile, I'll play the video of, um, of Dr. Richard Peter with us. Please hang on a second. of Cytox, and it's a pleasure to speak to you today about the application of polygenic risk scores. These might individuals with mild cognitive impairment who are at the highest risk of further cognitive decline uh, due to Alzheimer's disease. Risk 
associated or an E2 variant uh, tends to be associated with lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. So what, an, what a polygenic risk score does related to Alzheimer's uh, is it scans across the genome, uh, adds together in a weighted algorithm all the risk associated and all the uh, protective variants, uh, and then combines those with uh, age and gender to come up with a single uh, genetic score called a polygenic risk score in our case. Um, Score. The algorithm the Gina score is based on uh, was developed and published originally by the Cardiff University Group uh, back in 2015 in this very important paper uh, for, uh, published in Brain, uh, the lead author uh, being uh, Valentina Escort Price. Uh, and this algorithm was derived using logistic regression methods um, from data derived from the so called IGAP consortium uh, and was developed using. Um, genome-wide association data from 17,000 clinical cases of Alzheimer's disease and 37,000 age management controls and then the performance validated uh, um, in independent data. Uh, the algorithm the Cardiff team published at that time, the best performance version had about 87,500 SNPs. Our variant of this algorithm, which was developed uh, in an Innovate UK funded collaboration with the Cardiff team, uses more uses 112,000 SNPs and you can see here uh, this sort of um, independent validation data derived from various data sets, independent data sets, GERAD, TGEN and the uh, way you're looking at um, performance AUC or accuracy um, of 78%, 84% and that's considerably higher than for example could be uh, generated using APOE uh, alone based on uh, Alzheimer's disease, disease discrimination from age matched healthy controls. So um, it's very important, I've touched on APOE already, it's very important that any polygenic risk algorithm is able to perform uh, more effectively than APOE in defining uh, that at-risk population. Uh, we know, for example, in the Caucasian population, about 25% of people are APOE4 carriers. Uh, a small proportion, about two percent in total, have the two copies of E4 and are considered to be the highest risk of Alzheimer's disease. About twenty-three percent have one copy, the so-called E3 E4 heterozygotes. And then we know there's a big spectrum of risk there. Not everyone with E4 will develop Alzheimer's disease. And very importantly, just because you don't have the E4 allele, it doesn't mean that you won't develop Alzheimer's disease. So that that leads to a big problem. There's sixty. 1% of the E3, E3 homozygotes to copy the E3, there is no way to genetically stratify these uh, individuals with risk using obviously APOE alone at the moment. So whenever we present our data, we're always thinking about uh, how we have, whether we have improved indeed on APOE4 assessment. And that's going to be important that we'll see either for individual uh, risk assessment or risk assessment of populations or cohorts and stratified to clinical trial. So the first thing that we did when we defined our Genotor uh, algorithm was went back and compared its performance with the original Cardiff algorithm. Here we've used the, uh, we've been working with the ABDI data set, the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging study um, set up by Professor Mike Weiner at UCSF um, more than 15 years ago now. And you can see here um, in this nature of the bottom left that uh, we've got polygenic risk score on the x-axis. You can see the distribution, clear separation of the outside clinical cases in pink from the age-matched um, cognitively normal controls in blue, with some overlap in that sort of dark color pink, and the separation or differentiation here, the AUC, is around 80% which is uh, very comparable to the Cardiff version of the algorithm. So this was the first step in effectively validating the performance of our fixed uh, parameter genome score algorithm. But of course, what you really want to know is the ability to make predictions about future trends in cognitive decline and the propensity towards uh, development of Alzheimer's disease. And we hinted longitudinal 
ago, the subject has been followed, and then we know that then some of them have declined, and some of them have remained stable. So the question we were trying to answer was whether we could have predicted those the highest risk of decline. First analysis we did was using ADAS COG 13 change uh, of either 5, 10, or 15 points over a four year period. And the, um, the individuals in this first analysis um, were an MCI um, diagnosed group uh, using the Peterson criteria. And uh, there was uh, um, imaging, PET imaging for, for these individuals. So in this study here, um, 285 individuals with baseline diagnosis of MCI, uh, 61 of those over the next four years declined by 10 points or more, a significant change on ADAS COP13. Uh, 224 of those individuals remained stable. And Gina score was able to differentiate those groups with accuracy of 74%. That's really clinically important, knowing which subset of your uh, individuals who present with early cognitive symptoms are, are likely to decline further over the next few years and optimize their treatment. Similarly, if you then include MCI and cognitive normal individual baseline, and this bump numbers up to 515, in this case, 65 individuals declined by uh, 10 points or more on ADAS COG, 450 remain stable. The AUC here, those two populations apart, was 80%. If you look further into that data on the left hand side here, Again, on the x axis, polygenic risk score ranging from zero at the low end to one at the high end. You can see the individuals who decline by 15 points or more, let's see, the individual in the red, are all concentrated towards the right hand end of the polygenic risk range, as we might expect. Uh, individuals who remain stable five points or less are, are shifted to the, to the left. Uh, there, is, there are some individuals. Uh, you marked in grey here at the right hand, higher end, and we would argue that if you follow those for longer, these are individuals at the highest risk of further decline. On the right hand graphic on this um, page, uh, what we've done here is looked at the apple E distribution by overall polygenic risk score, and you can have color coded this so you can see the E4, E4 uh, homozygotes, the highest risk by apple E status, are all, as you might expect, concentrated at the right hand end. Highest end of the risk distribution, uh, whereas the E4, E3s, tetrazygotes, just carry one copy of E4. You can see these span quite a range, so there are some very high risk individuals, but uh, also some much more modest uh, risk, risk individuals. So, again, stratification even amongst the E4 carriers. Very importantly, in blue, you can see there's this uh, big sort of distribution normal shape distribution curve of the E3 homozygotes from very high risk, the right hand end, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, polygenic risk to very low, 0.25, uh, up to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, but there's also a lot of people in the middle. So you can see again what we're doing here is demonstrating the ability to stratify the genetic risk in the non E4 carrier population. That has huge implications for um, the way we can uh, think about identified at risk individuals. Okay. What we then did um, was uh, looked at the relationship between polygenic risk and underlying biomarker changes in the cerebral spinal fluid. So um, despite the, the difficulties of the interventional nature of um, CSF testing, it is quite uh, widely used. Um, and, and the P tau amyloid beta ratio is considered to be a, a good way of determining where people are in their progression and therefore the likelihood that they will decline further. So important to understand how that biomarker distribution uh, relates to the underlying polygenic risk. Just on the left hand side here, you can see a colored heat map essentially. Uh, on this graphic, we have polygenic risk on the x-axis, we have the tau amyloid ratio on the y-axis, and I'll remind you that in the, in the p 
now a blood ratio uh, in the CSF, uh, a, a ratio of greater than 0 0.028 is considered to be uh, biomarker positive. Uh, that's, a, that's a measure that was determined by Oscar Hansen and his team in Malmo. That seems to be a gold standard uh, that people are uh, using. So we compared our, our polygenic risk against this gold standard. And you can see individuals here in dark blue essentially all gather at the top right hand side of this uh, illustration here or this, this graph here. Uh, high polygenic risk and high tau amyloid ratio, cognitively normal controls in red are down at the bottom left, so low polygenic risk and low amyloid tau ratio, so below the cutoff for um, biomarker positivity. The late MTI individuals in purple are essentially mostly gathering uh, in the same area um, as the Alzheimer's disease uh, subjects, so high polygenic risk and uh, high above the threshold for biomarker positivity for amyloid and tau. For the early MCI individuals um, a bit more distributed. There are some with high polygenic risk, uh, some with much more modest polygenic risk. If you look then um, at the individuals who decline by uh, eight or 10 points or more on ADAS COG, the previous analysis, you can see that uh, the individuals who decline are all in this red area here. So uh, high polygenic risk, high tau amyloid, above the threshold for um, biomarker positivity in the CSF. And you've got this group of individuals here in blue, many of whom have a very low polygenic risk and are on the low biomarker threshold. There's a group here who have a higher polygenic risk, haven't yet converted to biomarker positivity at CSF, uh, but will be experienced. On the right hand side of this graphic, you can see that. Um, here we're, we're using a similar analysis, but using the P-tau amyloid uh, ratio of 0 0.028 as a cutoff. And you can see, again, those people below that threshold uh, have remained cognitively stable, whereas those that are in excess of that threshold are the ones who progress on CDR summer boxes. So these graphs are essentially uh, identical, suggesting that you get the same information from a far less invasive test, rather, but you could use blood or you could even use saliva uh, to identify, again, uh, the high likely progressive amongst this uh, MCI population. Uh, so just a reminder, the, the uh, genus called performance predicting uh, AD cases versus h match controls, which we saw earlier, was 80%. In this case, the ability to predict cognitive decline over a four-year period uh, for individuals like them with MCI uh, was 79%. So what does that mean about how we might think about using this test? Well, uh, it, it gives the opportunity to um, think about home testing, home assessment, or indeed using assessment without having to take um, in blood. So you may have a subjective memory complaint there or an individual with early symptoms, or perhaps even someone who's got concerns but not yet showing any symptoms. Uh, cognitive tests can be uh, used, obviously, in a clinic or perhaps remotely. We know lots of clinicians now are doing these tests online and at the same time the genus score test can be ordered uh, by sending a saliva collection kit to the individual who then puts it back in the post the DNA is extracted um, and then the um, individuals would then be or the clinician will be in a position to understand the risk for uh, that individual for further cognitive decline uh, due to uh, the propensity to develop Alzheimer's disease. Only then might the clinician think about bringing an individual into the clinic, particularly in these times of the pandemic, uh, bringing people out of their homes into a more risky environment you know, is not always wise. So the opportunity only then to focus on the, the need to, uh, uh, to have further diagnostic workup perhaps including MRI or CT imaging, maybe lump and plunger and maybe PET. So that you, you, you've got a way here to stratify individuals into those sorts of tests. So as a clinician, why would I want to know about um, the risk? Um, the argument being, well, there are no modifying, disease uh, modifying therapies yet available. Uh, so what can I do? Well, I think the work from me and Kim Health and others associated with the finger study are really showing that by modifying these environmental and lifestyle uh, risk factors, it can have a huge positive benefit uh, to individuals who are otherwise at high genetic risk. So, I guess aggressive treatment, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, um, promotes.
promoting diet, good diet and exercise, um, you know, educational learning, sort of uh, physical and social interaction, really important things. You know, and I think the, the motivation to actually do and maintain some of those things um, is, is uh, much greater in the presence of um, uh, a, a test result that puts you into the high risk category. Uh, we made um, a lab portal through which uh, GenoScore can be accessed. So uh, GenoScore-lab.com uh, is available. Um, it's got information on there for physicians and patients. We only offer this test via physicians. This is too important, too significant thing to be offered directly to consumers. But there is information uh, on this website that is aimed at uh, educating an individual um, by, by way of understanding what the test does and what could be done in the event of a, of a high risk uh, result coming out of that test. So simple steps, creating an account with the physician, we don't allow them to order uh, the test, we dispatch kits to that practice, the physician then uh, places an order online, um, the sample is sent to the lab uh, and the analysis that I uh, described earlier is uh, done and a uh, physician then can download the report from this portal, gets an email to say that the, the report is ready, and that's on the reporting time is between two and four weeks. Uh, the report contains uh, lots of information. Uh, this is live now in the UK and Europe, um, and we're planning to, to launch GenoScore uh, in the US uh, during the second quarter of this year. It's a three-page report that's been worked up with uh, input from uh, a group of uh, clinicians. Uh, includes a heat map presentation of the individual risk and where they sit in the context of a, of a population, either low, medium, or high risk, essentially. Uh, and we report that by quartile. Uh, it gives individual genus score as well as the APOE um, component. And on the subsequent pages, it places the, the, that data in the context of uh, overall population risk and how that evolved over time. I mentioned already that the uh, web portal has uh, patient facing information on there to explain how the test works, what's required for the individual patient, but also on sort of steps that can be taken, to, as I said earlier, to modify some risks. Uh, associated with environmental and lifestyle uh, choices. Uh, Cytox has um, uh, registered the uh, this gene score test uh, with the UK Healthcare Regulatory Agency and has the CE mark. And we're also certified um, under the ISO 13485 uh, regulations uh, for medical devices. So we offer high quality uh, testing and testing services. And just a, a summary at the end um, of the data that I've shown and, and some of the applications that we think are now uh, uh, attractive for potential users. So we've shown that we can stratify uh, the E3 for uh, subjects, the subset E4 uh, at the highest risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. We've shown that we can also stratify the absence of E4 uh, uh, carriers at all, the E3 hypozygote population, uh, to enrich those most likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the Gina score algorithm clearly improves the ability to predict individuals who will convert from MCI to AD or indeed. Uh, decline substantially on ADAS COG or CDR summer boxes, regardless of their baseline uh, at entry or at time of testing. Uh, the Gina score risk um, aligns well with the CSF biomarker status, uh, as measured by the tau amyloid ratio. Um, and of course, that overall that corresponds well with the CDR summer box change over a uh, four year period. Um, the, th the threshold of Gina scores of 0.6 or above can be used to enrich that population. Uh, MCI are most likely to decline cognitively, and of course that, that opens lots of um, applications, uh, of which I've listed just a few here. So certainly in the clinical assessment, uh, memory centers, dementia, brain health clinics uh, for subjects with mild cognitive impairments, subjective memory complaints, or indeed other concerns, we think that this could offer a, a very nice uh, alternative test that the, the patients um, we know already uh, are 
are, are very interested to understand. Research applications will include cohort analysis to identify subgroups of longitudinal follow up, further phenotyping, and of course, recruitment of clinical trials to, to allow stratified um, subjects, particularly using cognitive decline as an endpoint, uh, an endpoint for that study. And a non invasive test like this is a good way to. Um, I'd like to end just by acknowledging some of the great science and scientists behind this work. Um, the science uh, and the analysis carried out by the Cytox team was led by uh, Dr. Paul Adorn and Alex Gibson, uh, and a lot of work on the underlying software analysis uh, development uh, by Dr. Greg Davidson and uh, uh, Oliver Shoto, Shota. Um, our scientific partners, uh, I mentioned Cardiff already, and Valentina Scott Price, uh, Eddie Bellu. And uh, Julie Williams, of course, were contributors to this work, as indeed was uh, Professor John Hardy at UCL and Professor Clive Ballard at the University of Exeter. And I want to end as well by acknowledging um, our funders, um, who include um, uh, angel and private VC investors, as well as non dilutive grant funds from Innovate UK, uh, the leading uh, funding agency in the UK. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge the patients who. Um, participate uh, in these uh, longitudinal studies and provide the data uh, for uh, research like this to uh, 